pleasure this evening to welcome uh, Rob Badger and Nita Winter uh, for their presentation on Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And I just learned before we um, set up here that they've been working on this project for more than 12 years through several iterations um, from a more national spread down to a focus on California. Um, the foreword to their, their presentation is by Peter Raven, one of the foremost biogeographers and plant experts of the century. And in fact, who has intimate ties with the beginning of the Arboretum. He was a good friend of our founder, Ray Collette. And um, Ray, Raven came to give a talk at the Arboretum. And, and when it was over, you know, he went up to, to our founder, Ray Collette and said, Ray, what is all this garden for anyway? What's, it, what's its purpose? And Ray said to Peter Raven, it's to illustrate your book. And it was just perfect because you know, we represent the five, <laughs> the, the five Mediterranean climates from around the world in one spot. So without further ado, um, our Ray Collette Lecture Series continues this year after a year of, of emptiness with a 27 year wildflower journey, the making of beauty in the beast, California wildflowers and climate change presented by Rob Badger and Nita Winter. And we are very, very pleased to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. you want it? Sure. Um, it's really, really nice for us to be doing this presentation for a Santa Cruz organization because I spent five years living in Santa Cruz in the 70s. It was some of the best years of my life and I got to know the Santa Cruz ecosystem really well. So it's, it, it's just a treat to be talking to you all now. Um, we're gonna tell you uh, uh, about, as Martin said, uh, about the 27 year journey it took to create our wildflower book and our wildflower project, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And it's a very collaborative work that we've been doing over the years with a, with a great number of environmental organizations. We were fortunate to co-publish with the help of the California Native Plant Society. So we independently published this book so that we would have complete control over the title, the cover, the contents, and the 18 short stories that we'll tell you about later. And this is an, an uh, award-winning book that's received 12 awards, and we were really honored to receive the Ansel Adams Award for Conservation Photography from the Sierra Club last year. So this all started in 1992 when I was at a film processing lab in San Francisco. A, a friend of mine who was a good nature photographer came up to me and she said, uh, did you know that the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve is a really, really good year this year after six bad years, six possibly, you know, drought years. I said, no. She said, um, I'm, you know, you're a California nature photographer. You've been doing this for years. I assume you've been down there and you've seen the poppy reserve. I said, no, really, I haven't. She said, really? Well, then you, we really ought to go down there. So uh, she and a friend of ours and I, a couple of days later, went down to the poppy reserve and this was what we saw. Uh, the California Poppy Reserve, I believe, is about a two square mile reserve in the western part of the Mojave Desert dedicated to preserving the, uh, the state flower. What made this a very, very special year was that there was an abundance of these beautiful purple tipped bird's eye gilia mixed in amongst the flowers. Normally, uh, after having visited the poppy reserve since then for quite a few times, uh, I've seen the poppy reserve in a good year with a lot of California poppies, but not this great diversity of different colored flowers there. So again, this was a really, really special year. I mean, not, I stood in front of the scene and watched the waves of wind move across these golden glowing poppies in these purple bird's eye gilia. It was just, it was just hypnotizing. So I called Nita that evening um, and I said, you know, I've never seen anything like this. 
before. This is really exciting. You have to come see this. Uh, if, if the heat comes or, or the winds continue to dry out the blossoms, they may not be here very long. So uh, a few days later, I drove back up to San Francisco and got Nita and came down and we photographed there together uh, for about two or three days. And, and Rob and I are from, were both from the East Coast, the Northeast, and we had never seen wildflowers like this, um, like you see in the desert with these great blooms. So at that point, we just, we were in love. And we met um, 34 years ago in a photo lab. I was waiting for my prints and this print showed up. Thank you. <laughs> and I was actually a people photographer and that's why I wasn't going down to the poppy reserve initially because I had an assignment. And um, Rob's focus was, uh, was mostly on nature and, and creating beautiful images of nature. And many years later, after we discovered the wildflowers, we teamed up and both really put our attention um, towards the wildflowers. And we would sometimes go out for three to four weeks at a time um, when they were super blooms. And we managed to get through all this with the help of five and a half couples counselors. And we really love each other and <laughs> have for 30, 30 plus years. So uh, people often ask, what is the oldest image in the book? Uh, uh, and so uh, in 1984, a couple of years before I met Nita, I was uh, in the area uh, east of Carmel, the beautiful uh, oak, woodlands there looking for a, a wonderful picture of a California buckeye at around sunset. So I came across this very unusual buckeye and was fortunate to see these you know, pretty purple flowers there, which I had no idea of what they were at, at that time. So I thought, well, why not put some flowers in the scene and add some different colors? So, so this was taken in 19... 84. That's the oldest image in the book. And so you were at that time focusing uh, on the nature scene as opposed to the flowers. And after having been doing a lot of nature photography for about 25 years, uh, when I met Nita, I wanted to do something more than just have my, my, my images in books or calendars or or our magazines. So uh, I did some research. I found there are organizations, there are conservation organizations that hired photographers to uh, photograph the land conservation projects they were working on. So I was fortunate to connect with the Trust for Public Land. And over the years, I did 30 different projects on uh, different private lands that they were wanting to acquire and uh, convey into the public land system. This was private ranch land in, this, in the Sierra foothills that was adjacent to Sequoia National Park. Uh, so they sent me there for about two or three days. I documented the area as beautifully as I could. And this was eventually conveyed into uh, Sequoia National Park. And also at that time, I had been doing a lot of environmental issues, such as mining on public land, uh, uh, trying to reform the, 18, the old 1872 mining law that, uh, that was for over a deck for over uh, a century was uh, creating a negative environmental impact on our public lands. And I also documented forestry issues and mining issues. And I was just getting really burned out going to uh, so many different places and seeing all this devastation. Um, and so I, I just decided, you know, I just, I just couldn't take this anymore. It was just too emotional for me to be in all these places. So I, I uh, uh, again, I committed, my, I recommitted myself to using just the beautiful images to do something positive with respect to uh, land conservation. And as I, as I mentioned, I was a people 
photographer, but before that, one of the jobs I had was I was a firefighter for CDF, which is now Cal Fire. And this was, I always kept a, uh, a camera on my belt. And this was a picture of a water drop on the uh, burning uh, tires of land moving equipment, these giant tires. And that's why the smoke was so black and actually won an award with Nikon competition early on in my career. On the right is a photograph from the Children of the Tenderloin, which was a two year documentary project I did, which actually launched my uh, career in photographing children and families and creating healthy communities. On the left was um, a powwow at San Francisco State and the image was hand colored by Taya Schrack, who's a wonderful artist. And she hand colored uh, about 60 of my images that were included in um, CDF calendars that I illustrated over the years. And on the right um, is a picture of a seven foot banner that was part of a project, a series of projects called uh, The Faces, The Faces of the Canal, which is a Hispanic, mostly Hispanic area in uh, San Rafael, up here in Marin County, uh, Faces of Marin City, of Vallejo, which was one of the most diverse cities in the country. And they were to celebrate the diversity in not only ethnic diversity, but lifestyle diversity and age diversity in a community. And I started to have some health problems. So I pulled back from doing assignment work, which in, in a way was a blessing because it allowed me to go out with Rob Moore and photograph the wildflowers. So this is an image that someone took of us when we were in Carson Pass. Uh, Lake Winnemucca, which is just about maybe 30 miles south of Lake Tahoe. It's the convergence of different uh, ecoregions, which means that there is quite a lot of biodiversity. So we decided that we were going to backpack in there and carry all the equipment plus camping gear in and stay there for three or four days instead of doing day, pack, uh, day trips every day. Uh, backpacking there would allow us to spend more time to photograph more flowers. So I was carrying 85 pounds of gear, uh, uh, the natural light studio as we call it. Uh, everything that we photograph is done out in the field with natural light. So we carried diffusers and reflectors and clamps and things like that. I was carrying all that and then Nita was carrying 65 pounds of gear. Uh, but that allowed us to stay there and get more flowers in this beautifully diverse area. And I said I wouldn't do that again. Not yeah. that much weight. Yeah, me too. But we were actually up there in September, after way after Labor Day, because it was one of those years which was a very heavy rain year and therefore a heavy snow year. And the snow melted um, late. So the wildflowers were three to four weeks later than they normally would be. And that's one of the issues that comes up with climate change. We'll talk about that a little later as to the, the timing, the phenology of the flowers and the pollinators. And in order to be able to afford the work we were doing, we were fortunate to connect with uh, art consultants and architects and sell our images to get built into um, hospitals or be framed for artwork. And this is an eight foot tall by 20 foot wide uh, lobby divider. And we had seven different ones in this hospital and a total of 34 images built into the hospital. So it was really a lot of fun to be able to see our images of wildflowers in nature um, go into these healthcare uh, facilities that help with healing. The, uh, this is an image of uh, California poppies. And I developed a photographic technique that allowed me to get the uh, the petals of the flower gently touching the front of the camera lens. Uh, it was it was a technique I developed to uh, uh, photograph the flowers in a more abstract and softer form. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. Press the wrong button there. So here's another example. Every every uh, floor was a different color scheme. So. Uh, this 
the series of flowers photographing them this way is called the contact series and i'll talk about it later on when we uh, show people the work we do behind the scenes to get the beautiful flower images that we've gotten and even though we photograph wildflowers 12 months of the year here in california in the winter time we also enjoy going out and photographing birds in wildlife preserves First one was Woodbridge near Sacramento. This one is the Merced National Wildlife Refuge. And these images have also been used in healthcare facilities because they pro they've proven that nature helps with healing reduction of, of the need for medication and pain medication. So one of the most frequent questions we get asked is what is the most wonderful experience you've had photographing wildflowers? Well, in 2003, above the town of Gorman, which sits on Interstate 5 going uh, out of Los Angeles and into the valley at, the, at about the top of Tejon Pass, uh, there is this beautiful expanse of wildflower blooms that happens rarely. This was called a 50-year bloom back then in 2003. From the bottom of the valley where the freeway goes through up to the top of the ridge was a thousand feet high and this expanse of blooms with flowers covering just about every square foot of land was about a mile and a half wide. This is a detail of uh, some of the uh, areas in those previous scenes and you can see there's lupin and a whole other great varieties. Coreopsis, poppies. So the freeway goes through the bottom of the scene. You can just barely not see it. And the uh, the foreground was done on public land. You want to talk about yeah. this? This is the hung Hungry Valley State Vehicular Recreation Area. And we were really fortunate that we could come up um, onto the west side of the freeway into the hills and look back across it, that huge expanse that Rob was talking about. And the private land on the other side uh, is one of the few places where we photograph that was not public land, but we are certainly hoping that someday it will be so it is protected and not developed. So all these images with exception of the, of the details that I showed earlier, all these images were done from that location with a long telephoto lens. We arrived there when uh, a late uh, season storm was just clearing. And so there are these beautiful shafts of sunlight uh, moving across these hills. And one of the hardest things to do because just everything was so beautiful. There was so much intense color and so much contrast. One of the hardest things to do was settle on a, on a composition, uh, but it was just, just an amazing scene, something like we've never ever seen before. And I've been driving through there since 1966. And so it, to me, it really was a 50 year bloom because I had never seen anything like that before. And all the times I've been, I've been traveling through there. Our second favorite location or experience was the Carrizo Plains in, in 2017. And uh, wait a minute, 19, 17, excuse yeah. me, 2017. And that was the one that everybody was writing about and the news was covering. And um, we were, came across the Tembler Mountains from the Baker Seal, Bakerfield side of uh, Carrizo Plain National Monument. And what was interesting here was that you have the south facing slope on the left with no flowers and the north facing slope on the right, just covered in flowers. And on the other side of the Carrizo Plain was the Caliente Mountains. And we were told that there were desert candles blooming up there. And we had only seen a few in our travels. And we came around the corner and here was tens of thousands of uh, desert candles. And they were just amazing. And this was another area where there was so much beauty. There were so many different perspectives to cap to capture the flowers. This was another time when it was 
kind of difficult to focus on just one thing. So we did get a great collection uh, uh, of images there, but this shows for me, not only the uh, just, um, just amazing amount of flowers there in, in this rugged landscape, but also a bit of the detail of these beautiful desert candles. The desert candle has a hollow stem and so light reflecting through, uh, light transmitted through this makes it look like the stems are actually glowing. So you can imagine what, what it might, might, must be like to stand there and watch these things move in the wind. It was just really, really hypnotic. And, and, and one of the things that's really fascinating is this is actually in the mustard family. So uh, we asked everyone in the chat, what is your favorite favorite flower? Well, for me, my favorite flower is the desert candle or Calanthus inflatus. And as we were coming back from the Caliente Mountains, we looked back across to the Tembler Range across the Carrizo Plain. And this is what we saw. And to our right, to our, the, the flowers continued to the left and the right, and especially down to the right, and there would be huge patches of purple as well. It was about 60 miles long. You do have to be careful when you go out there in the spring if it's been wet because People can get stuck in the mud and it's very expensive to get towed out. But Rob wanted to include the, the road and the um, cars in there to give you a sense of scale. And here's a detail of the tidy tips and the Phasalia in that area. And this was taken, I took this with my iPhone and we figured out we used about 12 different cameras throughout the 27 years from the iPhone to Canon film, the Hasselblad with film, uh, to Canon digital, and eventually the Sony cameras um, with Canon lenses. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about how we actually get these images, how we photograph the flowers, the live flowers, the live plants in the field without doing any damage and how we use natural light. Now on the on the left side and the upper left is a picture of uh, of a sneezeweed that we photographed in the east side of the Sierra. So what we do is we put either white or black backgrounds behind the flower, because often there's a, a distracting background. And the point of all our photography is to show these beautiful flowers in their best light. So by isolating the background, we focus directly on just the beauty of the flowers. Uh, um, can I just interrupt for sure. a second? So this is a the two a two page spread that that's in the book. So we include the behind the scenes both in our traveling exhibit, which we'll talk about in a bit, as well as in the book itself. So after photographing the flowers with just straight black or white backgrounds, I was getting kind of bored with just this simple solid black. So uh, I started using some of the fabric we were putting behind the flowers and uh, creating these graceful uh, curves with uh, soft highlights on the curves to accentuate and complement the beauty of the flowers. So this is called the Wrapped Series. And as far as I know, I don't, uh, there aren't other people doing this uh, technique with photographing uh, live flowers out, out in the field. And it's really difficult because this is chiffon, um, one of the fabrics we use, which is very um, lightweight. And so the slightest breeze can mess up your whole composition. So with this process, the first thing we do is arrive at, ha uh, at, at the floral composition. And then we go into the process of, uh, of wrapping the flower. and Sometimes it takes quite a few different wraps before I get something that really, really looks good. And then the final way we Oops. photograph flowers is the contact series, like I talked about earlier. Uh, that's the uh, pink checker bloom uh, on, the, on the bottom. And I found a way to uh, get the flower gently in contact with the front of with the front of the lens and what that 
does is, al is allows only the transmitted light from the background to show through the to show through the flowers. Because I'm uh, blocking the light falling on the uh, on the beautiful blossom, the only light available for the image is, like I said, transmitted light. So this gives the flower a very soft, translucent and abstract look. And it's a very different way to show the beauty of these beautiful species. So I'm always uh, sure to in uh, to keep something that's really, really sharp in the photograph so that you have a sense of the detail and the, uh, um, and the shape. But I'm always uh, certain to make sure that a lot is out of focus to make things nice and soft. And it takes a lot of frames for him to get something that he really likes. I mean, as a nature photographer, he always worked on a tripod uh, doing the uh, portraits. Um, these images are his, hers, and ours, except the wraps and the, and the contact series. Um, it's something that Rob's really focused on by himself, and it really takes him off the tripod and allows him to be much more spontaneous and move um, with the flower to see what he can come up with. And this is the image that took the longest. This is two and a half hours in order to photograph this desert lily in Anza Borrego. I had found the flower the night before, but it was getting too dark. So we came back the next morning when the light was um, low and began to set up to photograph. And at that time, Rob was doing, um, was doing film with a Hasselblad and Polaroid so we could see what we were doing. Moving to digital was, really helpful in being able to see what was happening much more quickly. And the light was coming in from the left. And so the flowers on the left were getting their light, but the ones on the right were uh, in the shade. So we used um, fabrics and even a car shield um, for the windshield to bounce light back in. You don't have to spend a lot of money and be use fancy equipment to, uh, to do some of this work. And then on the right is a pile of, the left. excuse me, on the left is a pile of jackets and a, and a camera bag. Those were actually put there in order to block the sun from hitting both the sand and the leaves so that we would end up with this photograph. So what was really interesting about this image was normally this desert lily is a tall plant with blossoms, uh, off the stalks alternating on either side. It's usually about a two and a half to three foot high plant. Well, this year, this was a really abundant El Nino rain year and the plant, I guess, decided to put almost all its energy into new blossoms for, uh, for more seeds. So, so you ended up with three, three stems instead of one tall one. And you can see all those little buds were all going to be blossoms. We live in Marin County and Marin City, uh, five miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And Marin County is a great place for wildflowers because there's so much public land and also uh, a lot of diverse ecosystems. So sometimes we'll use uh, plexiglass and have the sun come through it. So you get a really bright white background. And as I mentioned, um, they're his, hers, and ours as far as images. I was known to have, um, I was a great eyesight. As a kid, I was called eagle eyes. And I have great color brain connection so that I can find flowers really easily. And Rob is a Capricorn and great with um, patience and detail so often he would be the one that would actually take the picture and was willing to be in really uncomfortable positions at times to do it. And then we would both look at the Polaroid or the back of the camera and um, decide whether it was the best composition. And these are just wonderful um, Calypso orchids. Nita had found this image on Ring Mountain uh, 
which is a uh, Ring Mountain Ecological Preserve in in southern Marin near Corte Madeira. She found this beautiful checker bloom. Uh, we didn't have time to photograph it, so I came the day before. It was one of those uh, spring days after a storm where there was this beautiful soft light, uh, no sunlight, just this beautiful soft enveloping light, and it worked well with uh, this beautiful checker bloom. And we had, I didn't even actually realize that it had all these wonderful curly lines in it, you know, the uh, the uh, stamens. Actually, probably the pistols. Someone will tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so as we mentioned before, we put a black background and uh, often we'll do a white background as well photograph the plant in place without harming it and then later go home and decide how uh you know which which version we we really like and often we like both and so i think in the book we decided that we were going to use one for the black background so all these uh floral images you're seeing of uh, are included in the book and well, actually we're... not all of them that one oh, isn't oh that's right that one isn't but most of them most of them, there are 190 images in the book. So again, this is how we work out in the field. And, and the most important thing is not to, not to harm the plant and not to harm the blossom, to do everything with the plant safe and sound in the ground. So we get into some really awkward places with strange tripod configurations to get exactly what it is we want from a flower we've seen and we had been looking for for this Indian pink flower for quite a while. And not only are we not wanting to disturb or damage the plant itself, but all the whole area around it as well. So we will often work very close to trails, very close to um, uh, side, of the road. side of the road. And sometimes we're dealing with a lot of wind and so we'll have to send, set up a tent. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so uh, we found this, this, uh, this beautiful plant and I had been wanting to photograph a good specimen of this for a while. So I photographed first the entire plant as you're seeing here with a white background. And then I zoomed in closer because this paintbrush, and I'm sure many of you know about the uh, uh, know about the paintbrush. This paintbrush, just uh, when you look at the tips, it looked like it was on fire. So I wanted to capture this and show what to me looked like a beautiful red flame against a white background. And again, there there were other flowers in that area. Again, with the wind, this is the headlands, which often has wind. And when you have a plant with a long stem, um, you need to find ways to, to keep it from moving around. And one of the other things that's really fun about some of these flowers is that they can be, have a really wonderful fragrance to them. This is the Western um, Azalea along the old stage road on Mount Tamalpais on, on the way to the West Point Inn. And um, if you ever get a chance to come across them, make sure you stop and smell the flowers because they're really beautiful. So again, work in areas that, that won't create damage. And we consider ourselves artists, photographers and artists. So we're always looking for creative ways to interpret a flower. Again, just off the road, using natural light. And uh, when we have the diffuser as a source of light, we can change the position of the diffuser. Sometimes we have the diffuser directly overhead. Uh, that shows a plant in a certain kind of soft light. Sometimes we'll put the diffuser at a certain angle. So there is some, still some direction uh, that the light is coming from, even though the light is soft 
end of use. So do you want to talk about this one? Yeah. So in this case, we wanted it from behind so that the the flower itself looked like it was um, lit from the inside. And then we also will use, often use deflect, uh, reflectors right in front of the camera so that we fill in the light so it bounces back into the uh, front of the flower so that isn't in too much shade. And this is um, another wrap plant up at uh, Ring Mountain. Rob mentioned Ring Mountain earlier. It's one of our favorite places in Marin County for wildflowers because it was, um, it's a preserve that was originally created by the Nature Conservancy because there is a plant there, the um, Tiburon mariposa lily that only lives on Ring Mountain and nowhere else in the world. And that's Mount Tam in the background. And this is the Tiburon mariposa lily, oh, quite there? different from many other uh, mariposas that are very colorful, pinks and orange and, and yellows. This one is pretty, pretty common. So uh, we asked in the chat, what's your favorite flower? And someone said, well, the whole Calicordis genus. So if you've seen this one, it's, you're probably aware that this is really, really different from, well, in my opinion, really, really different from a lot of the the different calicordis and very rare and we it generally blooms in june and we were just hiking on ring mountain and you could see the the uh flower i mean excuse me the leaf coming up so we know there are going to be quite a few of them this year but they're not even they haven't even started their stock yet so uh, again we've uh we photographed from from below sea level and death valley to really high mountain passes. This is Morgan Pass. Uh, we wanted to get up into a true alpine area where there were no trees. Uh, we had heard about this beautiful Alp, alpine, alpine daisy. So M Morgan Pass is about 11,000 feet. I carried my 65 pounds of gear up there and we created this beautiful uh, wrapped image of this alpine daisy. On the way back, we photographed this alpine uh, columbine. Always trying to have the the um, folds be something that complemented the flower and added to the composition. So as we mentioned before, we photograph the flowers in different kinds of light. Sometimes we'll photograph the flower in bright direct sunlight uh, and then use the, for the same composition and, and photograph with diffuse light. So again, using a, a, dif a diffusion disc, we have many different sizes. So I've, I've, I've spent hundreds of hours on the ground and on my knees looking at a flower. It takes, we figured out what, doing digital photography, uh, an average of, a, of about an hour to do a flower from the time we drop all of it and set it up, uh, take the flower image back up. But what that allows me to do is spend so much time with just one flower and just realizing the value of just this one individual in this landscape and how important it is to just protect the rights of this individual to live uh, you know, ex extend its biological heritage to the next to the next and future generations. And I also want to point out the knee pads. We'll talk about those in the future, but they're great knee pads. People ask about whether it's been photoshopped. Well, yes, everything has been brought into Photoshop to be processed because these are raw files that our cameras. Uh, this image was photographed under blue, just blue sunlight. Uh, the only, Im I mean, blue under, uh, under, under blue sky. Uh, the only part of the scene that's illuminated with sunlight is in the very, very top center of the frame. So because the camera sensor records the blue light falling on the scene, you have a blue cast on the image. So what we do in Photoshop is we bring the colors back 
to what it was we saw. Uh, the camera sensor in digital cameras uh, creates a very soft, low contrast image, and uh, then and in, low saturation and and low color saturation. And so, what we do in Photoshop is to bring it back to what it was that we actually saw and how our eyes adjusted for the for the blue light that was falling on the scene. Sometimes the plants are pretty large and we um, can't use a diffusion disc. We've got to use something larger like a sheet, which may have wrinkles in them. And so we take it into Photoshop and we clean up the background and make it a pure white. And in the process also trying to bring the plant to what we recalled or knew the plant looked like. So this is a two page spread um, of that uh, leopard lily that we photographed on Mount Tamalpais. Again, we all, we, other ways we deal with wind, one thing that's really helpful and inexpensive is an umbrella. Umbrellas help to, to block the wind and bring it around. We are, are up in the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountains and above Independence and photographing this really wonderful um, buckwheat. It's a wild buckwheat and very low to the ground. So we use two pieces of fabric um, together and then you can see all the sand that kept blowing onto the scene. Again, it's low saturation, low contrast. We bring it into Photoshop and we clean it up. So this image was on the road on the way to Onion Valley, Martin? I think, yeah, For, we were talking earlier uh, uh, about all the um, all the beauty of the Owens Valley and and the area uh, around Death Valley, and this is the two page spread in the book. So we talked about wind. Um, we have to deal with rain at times. We definitely deal with heat, and when we were in Utah, we had to deal with the bugs. The um, we were attacked by no seams. We were actually in the middle of nowhere. And within three minutes, they had found us. And they, if you don't know what a noceum is, um, they're smaller, much smaller than mosquitoes. They like to get in your ears, up your nose, in your clothes, and their bite is actually worse than, um, than the mosquito. It, it itches worse and longer. And so as a last resort, I went back to the car and found some clean, underwear and Rob and I each put a pair on over our heads to try to keep them out of our ears. But and unfortunately, Rob was, go ahead. Yeah, go. And, and, and we were photographing in the Great Basin Desert in the late spring and it was really hot. So uh, uh, every part of our body we had to keep covered up. But even then, you know, when I'm spending time on the ground in one place, these bugs find their way. And I, uh, I ended up with about 200 different bites. But that's what it took to photograph some of these beautiful Great Basin, Great Basin Canyon land type, uh, type plants. We also discovered after we put out our book that Homer D. House was doing this kind of work over a hundred years ago in the Northeast. And he would set up um, a box that would protect the plant from the wind because when it was on a cloudy day, he could have an exposure up to 20 minutes. And he wanted to um, find a way to preserve the colors of flowers because when you press flowers, you tend to lose the color. And so he has, um, several wonderful books out that you can still find on the internet. One's called Wild Flowers, it's two words, and the other one is Wild Flowers of New York, and it's a two-volume um, two volume book, and it's, it's really fascinating. And this is not going forward. Come on. There you go. So we were photographing throughout the West, as, as we mentioned earlier, and we met um, Joan Jasper, who was the, um, the head of programs and exhibits at the San Francisco Public Library. And she asked us to do a project that was 
uh, that focused on California. So we created Beauty and the Beast California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And this was an 100 image exhibit um, that later became a traveling exhibit, half of it, 52 images became a traveling exhibit, which is now up at the Los Altos History Museum. And um, so we included not only the images, um, but also many of the books that we would use as resources to find, oops, excuse me, sorry for that, to find the, um, uh, find out what the flowers were. And we also relied a lot on the California Native Plant Society um, members to tell us where to go and to help us identify many of the flowers. And I mentioned earlier about the uh, knee pads. One of the things I also wanted to mention that we kept in the case was a pair of binoculars, which I find really handy when you're looking for wildflowers. And the knee pads were made by ergodyne and they're made for the trades, but we found them really great for like kneeling in stiff jello. So they really protected our, our knees. And um, later on, you'll be getting an email with information um, about these. And right now, that's just opened on April 9th at the San Diego Natural History Museum is a custom large print version of our exhibit called California Blooming Wildflowers and Climate Change in the Golden State. And that will be up for about a year. So they sent us a mock-up of what they wanted, and then we had to prepare the files, especially those that were going 12 feet tall, to make sure there were no uh, imperfections because those would be magnified and really show up. So this is now, now open to the public, and we haven't gone down to see it yet. We're looking forward to it, but... Um, not ready to go down there. And to expand what we were doing with the um, exhibit was to um, create a companion coffee table book. And we wanted to go beyond the, the educational panels that were in the exhibit and invite a diverse group of scientists, nature writers, and um, environmental leaders to write short personal stories to, and Peter Raven is on the left. Martin had mentioned Peter Raven who wrote our forward. The book is divided into three sections, the gift of beauty, the human connection, and ensuring the future. So there's a total of 18 different short stories by 16 different authors ranging from an age from 20 to 82. Gordon Lepic wrote about wildflowers and climate change, and he's from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Brian Burnett, who's with Point Blue Conservation Science, he's been working on a uh, project on how climate change is affecting the mountain meadows and therefore affecting the epic migration of the Rufus hummingbird, which needs the wildflowers to make its trip from uh, Mexico all the way up to the Northwest and Alaska. And if the plants aren't blooming in time, because either there wasn't enough snow and they bloomed earlier, or there was too much snow and they bloomed later. Or it's warmer. Or it's warmer um, and the, the flowers bloom earlier and then it gets too cold because it's too early. Um, and then the buds uh, freeze. There are many things that are now um, being affected by climate change. And the Rufus hummingbird population he's finding is actually in decline. So, so this is the luckiest image in all the 27 years we've been photographing uh, that I've, or Nita has gotten. We were photographing this beautiful, tall, scarlet fritillary uh, on lower table rocks in Southern Oregon. And uh, because it's such a tall plant, it, it, it moves quite a bit, even in a gentle breeze. So I had had a fast shutter speed to stop the movement of the plant when it finally uh, died down a, a, a bit. I was looking through the viewfinder and I had the remote uh, shutter 
released, ready to go. I saw this bird come in. I got two frames. It came and went really, really quickly. So that's the raw file that I captured. And when we finally took it into Photoshop and cleaned it up, that was what it was we saw. So I was very fortunate. And we, uh, we waited there for about another 20 minutes, hopefully for the bird to come back. And it and it and it never did. So, um, but this was in something we really had to include in the book, and it's on the back cover as well. So as Rob mentioned, it was a very collaborative project. So we used information from different organizations as well as the essays. In this case, the National Wildlife Federation's um, some of its text about pollinators, try to encourage people to plant natives. Susan Twite wrote about the five deserts in, in California. Robin Wall Kimmerer, a uh, well-known author and botanist, Native American uh, member of the uh, Potawatomi Indians. She talked about what's in a name and it's a wonderful last say about um, the evolution of naming of the, of the um, wild strawberry. Wendy Takuda, a retired anchor, a news anchor. Um, when she retired, she started doing restoration work and pulling broom, and she wrote a very funny story called Zen and the Art of Pulling Broom. Talking to children about climate change without scaring them by Amber Paris. Gen Genevieve Arnold um, talks about seed banking as well. There's a section in the book devoted to fire recovery and fire ecology. There's also a short story uh, about that. So we wanted to go to some of these areas that had been burned and show people what comes back after a fire has gone through. And wildflowers can really uh, benefit from burns if they're not too hot because the ash works as a fertilizer and it also clears the um, the over story. What do you call it? Right. The, yeah. yeah. And so allows them to get a lot more sun. And this is only six months after a fire in Lake County that devastated homes and and a lot of the land. This this land that you're seeing had all been burned, and it was all com completely. Uh, just just scorched so you can see all the different species if you look quick if you look quickly that it that it come back there were um there were you know the the uh plants in the lily families do do really well the after, bulbs yeah the bulbs do really really well after a fire and this meadow and and the next few had all been burned if you looked at the soil at, uh, at the base of these plants, it was completely charred. Again, it takes away the, the thatch and so it really clears it for new growth. This is in the Pepperwood Preserve. And this was the Tubbs fire where a lot of people lost their life in Santa Rosa. Yeah. But the, the wildflowers that come back can just be absolutely gorgeous. These these two uh, flowers near Nita found found together out in the field, and so I thought, oh my gosh, what a beautiful combination of this purple and yellow. And so we use soft light to photograph the flower. And we're going to take you through the desert, um, one of our favorite places to photograph. This is Death Valley, with a desert sunflower at the base. Uh, this was the um, Lake deposits in the background during one of the super blooms in Death Valley. And another part of the, of the valley on the same trip could be completely different, different geology. And again, another part doesn't look like there's much blooming at all, but if you look closely enough, we found this broom rape that was hiding among the, the pebbles. And this as well, and we always look for insects 
And that crab spider can be bright, bright yellow on yellow flowers. This is Death Valley, uh, the uh, super bloom in 1998. And then there was another super bloom seven years later and with climate change and the, the droughts and the deluge, we actually are getting a lot more of these blooms. So now they're calling them super blooms instead of hundred year blooms. They used to be called hundred year blooms because that's when all the, only about once every hundred years did the conditions come together. This is Joshua Tree National Park. Joshua Tree has a lot of granitic soil, uh, has a lot of granite. So it weathers out to really coarse granitic soils in some areas. So it's really interesting to see these beautiful flowers coming out of this coarse granitic soil. Uh, this is a beautiful desert Canterbury bells. This is the average height that this plant grows to. And this was an average year. There are a few plants scattered in this wash. In, in 1998, again, a uh, uh, super bloom year, there was so much rain uh, that, and it lasted for so long that a lot of flowers ger germinated in this coarse granitic soil. And not only were there a lot of flowers, but they kept growing taller and taller. So there were more blossoms and just this beautiful abstract feeling in the soil that if you'd seen a few months earlier, virtually nothing was there. So we're always trying to turn these flowers into um, a different way of seeing them. This is Anza Borrego Desert State Park. The southern part of, of the park is a really wonderful place to photograph for, uh, for floral landscapes. We're always looking for a different way to show the flowers in the environment. And often there's some interesting rocks behind them. So this is granite in the background. Again, here's the desert. Lily on the right, this is the two page spread with the um, desert chicory on the left and a very different angle of photographing it than you usually see. And it was so wet in uh, 2005. 2005, we were there nine out of 12 days, we had some precipitation. So we had the joy of getting fog there as well. And this is, Anza, uh, I'm sorry, this is Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve where it all started. And uh, this was probably taken eight, 10 years after and another beautiful bloom with the San Gabriel Mountains and snow in the background. I, uh, again, you'll, there's some beautiful ground details that you can see uh, with these great diversity of plants coming uh, out of the soil. And Rob Med, Med talked about the images um, from Gorman with the storm clouds. After we left Gorman, we came back into, came to Antelope Valley and created this image, which ended up on the cover. But as you can see, it's all poppies. There's not much of a mix of other flowers in it. So our purpose is to inspire hope and action. We want people to feel that they can do something to make a difference. And in the book and in the exhibit, as well as on our website, there's a list of things you can do to make a difference. The book actually has 25 different things. So vote. You can plant um, local native plants in your garden, join local chapters of the Plant Society, donate to climate change and conservation organizations, volunteer to support restoration work. One of the things that's really a valuable and fun is to become a citizen community scientist. I Naturalist and Nature's Notebook are two of the sites where you can upload photos with data and observations, and it becomes very helpful to scientists around the world. And uh, if you don't know the name, they'll help you with that. Uh, there are a few images of flowers in the, in the book uh, where we had taken the flower, uh, made an image of the flower outside of the uh, outside of California. This was a uh, 
a really wonderful prickly poppy in 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 Nevada, but because uh, this plant also grows in in the state, we decided to include it and other flowers that we photographed outside the state that also grew in California. Again, we're looking for interesting backgrounds always. So this flower was found right in front of this beautiful serpentine rock. Table North Table Mountains Preserve is another area that we really like up here in the Chico area. The mountains have some really unique flowers. So these are all two page spreads that are found in the book. And as we said, many of these images, most of these images are found in the book along with another hundred and something. And people ask about identifying plants. This is all gonna be available through the Arboretum PlantID.net is probably the best one to start with as beginners. Calflora gets even more involved and you can um, find different areas to, to identify whether your plant is specific to that area. And the California Native Plant Society website, Calscape, also offers a wonderful thing. If you want to plant natives, you can go to the gardenplanner.calscape.org and you can talk, put in the type of landscape that you have, and it will actually tell you what's native to your area and what's best to plant. Wildflower Report Resources, Theater Payne Foundation uh, has a website that's wonderful. The California uh, Native Plant Society uh, Facebook group and DesertUSA.com uh, covers not only California, but other states as well. Theater Payne is mostly Southern California. So we'll just go through a few more images and, um, and then we'll open up to questions. So it took us almost three months to get the right inks and the right process in order to print the book to have such brilliant colors that you can see on the screen. We were really pleased and we've won 12 awards. I think I mentioned earlier. We include an ecological regions map. There are 14 different regions in California. We have a glossy, glossary because there's a lot of uh, terms that people may not be familiar with in the essays and two indices. One is for plant names and the other is for locations. And the book's available in two forms. One is the regular edition book and the other is the deluxe signed limited edition book that comes with a clamshell box and a special cover and a signed numbered tip-in page. And if you get a hold of a regular edition book, we encourage you to peel back the paper cover, the dust jacket, to find the true cover hiding underneath. So we want to thank you for staying with us. We, it's it's over an hour and we're uh, grateful that we've got people that are still here and we welcome questions. And we like to end with a wonderful quote by David Brower, truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, and more wit in defense of the earth. Thank you. So thank you again for joining us and you can learn more or find the book on wildflowerbooks.com. We have information on what you can do to still connect with nature during the pandemic. You can um, watch videos, et cetera. It's, it's, a, it's a lot more than a bookstore. <laughs> And you feel free to contact us through the website as well. We always love hearing from people. And you can, if you live in the Bay Area, you can order a book and um, pick it up at our home in Marin City, and it can be signed and personalized as well. Perfect gift for Mother's Day. Yes, if we can get one that. And it helps. <laughs> yeah, and and buying buying books helps us um, 
support the work we're doing. And we also love to connect with uh, libraries. If you have a local library that you want to carry the book, please let us know and we'll, um, or let them know to contact us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, we have uh, one more question. Uh, you already addressed the Photoshop question early on, um, and it is a very useful tool uh, for those who have the subtlety to use it properly, which unfortunately I don't. But the next question is, have you tried printing on metal? Have you tried different surfaces for your prints? Yes, yeah, uh, we've, been, we've been printing on metal. There's a company we use in Concord in the East Bay. It's called Magnachrome. And, uh, oh, we love printing on metal. One reason we love it is because it's a really, really green product. Uh, the uh, metal is aluminum, so a lot of uh, aluminum is, you know, has a highly recycled component. Well, they it. say it's 99 to 100% recycled in, and, in these uh, prints. And that way we're not paying for, you know, matting and framing and, 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 and plexiglass and also not using all those materials. And um, it's waterproof and scratch resistant, which is really nice. So we've, we've been printing on metal for at least 10 years, probably 12 or 15. And I think the largest we've gone is four to eight, four by eight feet in a hospital setting. Yeah. Wow. That is amazing, amazing that you can do it that large. I always think of it as, yeah. as a much tighter format. Yeah, and um, then the architects have used other materials as well, but we just provide them with the files and then they, um, they have it fabricated, whether it's on a resin or whether it's on a, on a wall paneling. So there's bit, our images have been used on a number of different materials, but we haven't printed on those. Ah, I see. Well, um, we have no more questions here. Um, if anybody else has a question, you better be typing now. And once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and a special thanks to Nita and Rob for their wonderful work. And I'm very inspired and I will be getting a copy of the book because just the, the addition of the narratives of the uh, 18 authors along with those images is a real treat. You don't often get, you know, a lavishly illustrated book with a whole uh, supporting narrative component. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, here's a question. What, oh, process, thank you. what process you typically print your images? Oh, and also how much is the uh, book? We, <laughs> how much is the book? Yeah. The book is $60 mm -hmm. and we wanted to keep it low so uh, more people could afford it because the goal was to get our message out and, uh, and, and inspire people to actually do something. Um, so the book is $60. What other, uh, what was your question? The process, the other, well, we have other, a 44 inch, yeah, we have a 44 inch Canon printer. And so we print um, our fine art prints on a Hannemule paper. It's an inkjet process. So that's how what we can do in-house. Right. And I also wanted to just point out that I've noticed that Sarah's been adding a lot of these um, links in the chat. And for those who don't know, you can go down to the chat, the bottom of the chat and click on the three buttons and you can actually save the chat if you want that information. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Those are some good resources. Thanks for putting those up, Sarah. Uh, let's see. Gina Smith on chat is saying she's having difficulty finding the website. Do you mean the Arboretum website? Um, I've answered in writing that the recording will be available. Oh, wildflowerbooks.com, your website. Your website, Robin Nita. Wildflowerbooks.com. Excellent. I just put it. Yeah. Great. Okay, so was she able to find it? Um, it's wildflower I, books, one word. I'm sorry, I put it in yeah, there as someone put it, it is, in there as two words. No, it's correct. You have it correct. Wildflowerbooks.com. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Still trying. Well, I'm going to send you my 
I'm going to give you Rob's email address. If you're still having trouble, you can email him or you can go to winterbadger.com. It's my name and his name. We really lucked out. Um, oh, she got it. Good. All right. And uh, the Winter Badger site is our other photography in, as well as the, uh, the wildflowers. Excellent. My people photography, Rob's environmental work. More, more birds, including penguins. Last questions, too, from Colin McKenzie. What camera are you using now and what size files do you capture? Uh, right now, I'm using a Sony A7R. It's a full frame. It's an A7R Mark III. Um, it's a full frame, 42 megapixel camera. Uh, when I open the processed raw file up into a full-size Photoshop file, like a PSD file, it's about uh, 350 megabytes. So it's a big file. The reason mm -hmm. we use that is, uh, as, as we've shown, we make really, really large prints. And also when I'm doing wildflower close-ups, when I've got that much resolution, I can photograph farther back to get more depth of field. I don't have to be right on top of the flower to, to still enlarge it and make a lot of detail. Right. And then I have the A7R II, which is a 36 megapixel yeah. camera. So Nita, Nita gets my hand-me-downs. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay, then that was our last question. Thank you all. Thank you, Rob and Nita. I look forward to the book and I hope I'll meet you in person in the Arboretum one day. Oh, Someday. absolutely. Absolutely. We can't wait till we get out more. Excellent. But, uh, thank you, Martin, Sarah, Marissa, and, and everybody who attended. Thank okay. you. Have a good evening. Thank you all.